Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and a special welcome to another lecture this evening by Sir Geoffrey Nice. Um, and welcome especially to those of you downstairs. This evening it's going to be a little bit different than usual, but we are going to have a live connection with Sir Geoffrey, which we're going to um, bring up any moment now, and he will explain the situation fully. In addition, we have Miss Sarah Clark here, a barrister from Inner Temple, who has worked with Sir Geoffrey, who will also be involved um, and hold the fort if necessary, if, if we have a problem with the connection. Thank you. Good evening, class. <laughs> and a special good evening to those of you who are downstairs. Um, a special thank you to Sarah Clark for uh, agreeing to help out at what I'd intended to be an interactive lecture and that will be an interactive lecture because I can leave the interaction to her. Last lecture, I approached in broad and somewhat historical terms the question of whether human rights as a special brand of right existed at all. And perhaps I encouraged you to think that if they did, it was as a result of a long process, a historical process, in the latter parts of which, and in particular in the creation of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and in the European Convention and European Court, of human rights, Great Britain had played a considerable part. I invited you um, last lecture to let me know by today whether there were particular aspects of law as you understood it connected to European human rights courts and procedures about which you had concerns or about which you were critical. In the event, I'm afraid I've received very limited response from the audience and therefore I've had to consider myself what topics might most probably concern, first of all, the average Gresham audience. Of well, course, the average Gresham audience may not be the average audience. You may or may not be mildly liberal in tendency. How can I know? But even if you are, it occurred to me, even the occasional Guardian reader, it occurred to me, may from time to time think that the law has gone too far in issues of immigration and deportation and extradition and certainly in the area of prisoners having the vote. So, in the absence of a steer from you, I have made those the basic topics of what we are going to consider and talk about tonight. If we start off with the movement of people into our country and away from it, I must think of something mischievous to say with which to start you thinking. Now Leah, let it be remembered, was master of all he surveyed until he partitioned up his lands among his daughters and found himself exiled effectively from them all. The passing Martian, the intelligent Martian, who might look down on our globe, he certainly wouldn't visit here for fear of being farmed if he was succulent of flesh, um, or kept as an animal in a zoo otherwise. But the intelligent Martian 
driving by might say to his co-pilot, given his ability probably to look at our hundreds of thousands or millions of years of development as a small and comprehensive passage of time, he might say, what a funny bunch they are. They grew out of Africa. They then populated the other bits of their round world. And having done that, even the Africans, the parent race, would find it difficult to gain entry here and there because states once formed become dogs in the manger about the property they occupy. Well, those some early thoughts, perhaps, to set you thinking. And let us turn straight away. I'm afraid it's not a day for exciting slides. Well, maybe, but not to begin with. Let's turn and see if we may, please, the first slide which I want you to look at, which is Article 13 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Article 13 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights says that everyone has the right to freedom of movement and residence within the borders of each state. Everyone has the right to leave any country, including his own, and return to his country. Article 14 of the Universal Declaration says that everyone has the right to seek and to enjoy in other countries asylum and freedom from persecution. This right may not be invoked in the case of prosecutions genuinely arriving, arising from non-political crimes or from acts contrary to the purposes and principles of the United Nations. Two more dull slides and then I'll ask you a question. The European Convention on Human Rights has a fourth protocol which rather reflects what we have already seen. Everyone lawfully within the territory of a state shall within that territory have the right to liberty of movement. Next paragraph. Everyone shall be free to leave any country including his own. No restriction shall be placed on the exercise of these rights other than such as are in accordance with law and are necessary in a democratic society in the interests of national security or public safety for the maintenance of public order for the prevention of crime. So, free to move subject to national security and public safety. It happens that the United Kingdom has signed but has not yet ratified that protocol and is one of the few states of Europe that has not done so. Finally, or nearly finally, the restriction on the right of, of entry is subject to a directive of the European community and I've highlighted the general principles that member states may restrict the movement of individuals on grounds of public policy, public security and public health. And that measures taken on these grounds have to comply with the principle of proportionality and shall be based exclusively on conduct of the individual. And note what follows. Previous criminal convictions shall not in themselves constitute grounds for taking such measures. Well, ladies and gentlemen, let me pause there. I don't think I, I can see you, but not terribly well on this machine at the moment. But let me ask you this question. Does this statement of um, rights seem sensible to you? Perhaps Sarah will help me in encouraging you to active response. Does it seem sensible to you that you and I should have freedom of movement, not just within us, 
state, but outside it. I think Sarah. We've got a taker over there, gentleman with the red um, shirt. Thanks very much, Mr. Hawkins. It's Bob Whitford speaking. Um, I did approach you regarding the ECHR with an actual case example. Um, the, the, the subject you've mentioned here, um, I take it one has to rely on the exigencies when each state where this law is applicable to. Can you expand on that, please? I'm afraid I can't hear you terribly well, sir, and I shall ask Sarah to summarise the views expressed. Yeah, I think the difficulty was the microphone was too close, so perhaps try again with the microphone a bit further away. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for the presentation, Sir Geoffrey. It's Bob Whitfield. Um, the statement you, the, you, you or on the screen now, which you've said, one assumes they are subject to exigencies in each applicable state. So therefore, they may not be equal to all states. Would that be right? The question was about the different approaches taken by different states in relation to the um, rights and obligations in the slides that you've just outlined. Was that broadly it? Yep, I'm being told that was it. Right. Thank you very, very much. Um, let's go back to the uh, PowerPoint presentation or sort of presentation that we have. Because, ladies and gentlemen, um, there's, they say, you know, to, to, to do once is better than to be told a thousand times. And we've just been looking now at this single universal human right that you and I probably, most of the time, have been fortunate to enjoy. But I'll now explain to you why I'm not with you tonight. I'm actually tonight in Jerusalem. And I'm in Jerusalem, next slide please, for the following reason. I found myself um, in the course of work on what is known as the Gaza Strip which you can see on the first map slide, marked by the word Gaza, uh, southwest of Jerusalem. And those of you familiar with this part of the world, next slide please, will know that the Gaza Strip is literally a tiny strip of land, at most about 12 kilometers from sea to the fence with Israel, and much narrower in other places. You will probably recall that this last summer there was another war between Israel and the Gaza Strip that lasted 51 days. In the course of that war, 2,100 Gazans were killed, whereas only a rather limited number of Israeli soldiers and a much very small number of civilians were killed. But I'm not here to argue or express any view on the comparative rights of the two sides of that conflict. But what is absolutely clear is that Israel has complete control of the Gaza Strip. There is only one crossing ever open now. It's the crossing at the top, the Erez crossing, because Egypt has, crossed, has closed the crossing at the bottom. In consequence, when without warning, three days ago, Israel closed the Erez crossing, for no good reason. I joined the 1.8 million Gazans as a prisoner, effectively. They are imprisoned within this strip of land all, all the time. It is very difficult or impossible for them to get out. Socially, almost impossible, I understand. They can get out sometimes to Israel for medical reasons. It's very difficult for students to get out even to study abroad. They are locked in this piece of land. 
vulnerable to attack on all sides, with the Israelis reducing the area of sea uh, to which they are free to go safely without being shot at to fish. And if, if you look at the eastern and northern boundaries, you will see quite a, an appreciable pink margin by which their territory has been completely reduced, thus reducing them um, uh, from uh, about 17.5% of agricultural land. Now, I had an experience of being without the freedom to move. I have no doubt how important that freedom is. Next slide, please. This is what it was like to be in a place from which you had no freedom to get out in the summer of this year. Think on that. Most conflicts, however miserable they may be, have for some or all of the duration of the conflict a corridor through which you can leave to become at least a refugee in another state. for example, for the Yugoslav conflict. Here, no wonder every member of the population was terrified for 51 days, unknowing of where the next attack would come and having nowhere to go. They lived in terror. The women, um, always concerned about their modesty, didn't change their clothes for 51 days not for fear of, of living in embarrassment, but for fear of being caught dead without being fully clothed. And when the actual conflict ended, this is a typical example of what is left. Now, I tell you this not to explore further the business of um, the, the conflict, although I will probably deal with that as an opening lecture or so of my next year's series and look at it from a legal point of view. But I mention it for this reason. Those of us who live in secure societies with freedoms so available, we take them for granted, may be inclined to underrate them, to undervalue them. And when we come to think, as we are in being encouraged to think of throwing away or at least taking less seriously aspects of um, human rights law, of which the freedom to travel is one, it is worth remembering, as I shall now never forget, the realities of life for others without those freedoms. Next slide, please. In the movement of people um, around Europe, in one way and another, the principal article that has caused problems, you may recall from, if you're not lawyers, from the uh, popular and even heavy press, is Article 8 the right to respect for private and family life that says everyone has the right to respect for his private and family life, his home and his correspondence, and that there shall be no interference, save in the interests of national security, public safety, or the economic well-being of the country, and so on. But it's that right. The question is, at first sight, how does it seem to our audience that there should be an enshrined right to family life? Okay. Does anyone want to respond on that? Your perception of a right to family life. Yes, we've got one. I'm going to turn the camera around. Um, I, I would certainly want to have a family life without the government 
um, barging in to um, investigate what I'm doing, particularly with regard to my online correspondence. It's innocent enough at the moment, but if the government were less benign, I might be exceedingly worried about what they would like to do. So I encrypt as much as I can. Thank you. There you go. Anyone want to express a similar or alternative view? I think um, the right to um, a family life should be subject to granting that right to other people. And uh, where we have seen um, uh, criminals and so forth interfering with the rights of other people, then they should, uh, in my view, be prevented from enjoying their own rights. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to uh, express a view? Yes, we've got one more, Geoffrey, and then back to you. Okay, if you, could, if you can summarise them for me, because yeah. I, can, I can hear you very well, but not them so well. Ah, oh, right, okay. Just a quick one. Nations may go along and uh, abide by the law, but in grey areas, the European Court of Human Rights may make recommendations that may not be applied to national governments. Right, okay. I'll try and summarise those if I can remember them. Um, one speaker said that the importance of uh, right to private and family life was really crucial and above all else. Um, the second speaker said that, um, that interferences caused by criminals was a serious issue. And the third speaker said, I'm sorry, I can't remember quite exactly what the point was. Nations may agree with the European Yes. I see. The may not yes, so the third speaker made the point that European courts derive their powers from domestic law. And therefore, although the European courts may make recommendations, it's actually for the domestic law to um, decide what, what's appropriate. Did you hear all those? Thank you. And I, okay. Yes, I did. I think that as we consider on this session and in the next one, the last I'll deal with uh, human rights, we consider the way these matters unfold. It is indeed the case, as I explained in the last lecture, that ultimately the domestic law does have the power to deal with things, even if it takes some time. And one of the issues that we may all have to consider is whether it's not actually such a bad idea for the route from a difficult problem to a solution that may be imperfect, but the best solution we can make, take some time, spend some money, and involves people not just from our own country and with our own inbuilt thinking processes. The 19th, if we look at immigration, the 1970s, Immigration Act set broad powers to deport people if it was conducive to the public good. And it's the addition to that very generally summarized approach of Article 8 that has indeed caused some, cons some considerable concern. The practice in deportation or cases of administrative removal has been to consider the family seriously and indeed to consider it as a whole, looking at not just the interests or the shortcomings of the parent or the concerns of the parent, but also to look at the interests of the child because the child of somebody vulnerable to being moved around um, without choice is in no way guilty, as Baroness Hale said, for the uh, shortcomings of the parent. But the problems that this was creating led in 2007 consideration of deportation in the case of people sentenced to 12 months or more, subject to certain exclusions that he included uh, possible breaches that would be caused of the Geneva Convention 
on refugees. I can see you well enough, and I hope you won't be offended this time If I ask you to reveal by a show of hands upstairs and downstairs, I'm awfully sorry we haven't got the equipment to see you as well. Do you, how does it seem to you to have a 12-month cut-off point um, for um, automatic consideration of deportation? Or sh should there be a complete discretion? Would anybody who thinks 12 months is about right for automatic consideration like to raise their hands? And those who don't think, would they like to raise their hands? I can't see a vote. Am I encouraging you too much to be involved? Was there a display, Sarah? Um, I think. I think the no's have it. The I no's have hear. it. The no's have it. I think so. Twelve months is not is not a sensible restriction, right? Well, let's let's move to the next topic. Not the next topic. The next subtopic that causes a lot of concern, and let's go to the next slide. Um, which I hope is the slide I've got. My, um, I don't know what's wrong with this particular aspect of my machine. But the next slide should show um, the convention, the torture provisions. Ah. Yeah. yeah. Yes, that's what we've got here. Got it. Right. The next slide tells us that under Article. Under Article 5 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights, no one shall be subjected to torture or to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. Now, that's something from which, which is written in such absolute terms, the torture provisions, uh, that it can't be derogated from. You can't, you can't get round it as a state. And we live in a country, I suppose, where there's not too much torture going on. There is indeed some, but it's not institutionalized torture, so far as we know. And cruel, inhuman, or degrading treatment or punishment is also not a matter of institutional behavior, even if it happens with individuals. Now, you may all know that this led, it started in a case in 1996 called where a man, an Indian Sikh, who was to be extradited, sent back to India, claimed that if he did, he was likely to be vulnerable to being tortured. And he complained to the European Court of Human Rights about the risk of torture and complaining of procedural shortcomings. He won, and despite difficulties or objections by the, the state here, this led to various developments. The Special Immigration Appeals Tribunal, where you have special secure, security cleared advocates who speak on behalf of the person alleging he will be tortured, she or he will be tortured. Uh, although that advocate can't communicate with the person concerned and can't take her or his instructions. But, and in this way, um, the, the country recognized that you can't derogate from Article 3. Um, uh, and because you can't derogate from Article 3, they then introduce something else called control orders, where people of a certain background and criminal record sometimes um, live in a form of liberty, but subject to very considerable control. What could the country 
do. What it did was it tried to get round this problem by having memorandum of understanding with countries to which people might be extradited who were thought likely to use torture, getting them to undertake that they would not. But some of those countries, certainly with uh, similar arrangements with other countries, showed that their undertakings were perhaps not worth the paper upon which they were written. And so here's really quite a, a, a tough issue for any country to deal with. Um, if you really think, and really nearly everybody does, that you cannot allow your fellow human beings to be tortured or subject to cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment, then you have to find a mechanism for dealing with them in your own country. And it, I suppose one way or another, and in summary, the only way you can do that is by derogating to some extent from the processes whereby you would normally be entirely free. Now, that's putting it in a very summary way, but w would anybody like to say whether they think that's broadly right or not? Um, it seems to me that if we look at um, these matters on a moral, against a moral scale, the difference between incarcerating somebody for 20 years and physically beating them up or torturing them um, is morally equivalent. It also seems to me that if on a, a micro scale I would be prepared, as, as I would be, to inflict any torture or cruel treatment on someone who I knew had, let's say, someone close to me, a wife or a child, somewhere, and that wife or child would die unless this person gave me the information I needed. If I'm prepared to do that on a, an individual basis, it seems to me that the country should be prepared with adequate controls to inflict torture or any other cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment on an individual if it would save the lives of other innocent individuals. We seem in the modern age to have a repugnance against uh, physical ill-treatment of people and yet we essentially torture them when we put them away for long lengths of time without uh, being near their um, their loved ones and so on. We inflict a whole variety of uh, uh, degrading treatments on people in our own society just through the, um, the material differences there are within society. I'd like to uh, um, Thank you very much, views. sir. I, I heard part of that. And Sarah, if you could face me and tell me, I think. Yes, yeah, so um, I, I, I'm not sure if I've summarized this correctly, but um, broadly what the gentleman was saying was that if an individual would be prepared to carry out acts of torture on the basis that if they didn't do so, a member of their own family might be killed or tortured, then um, a state on a, on, a, on a wider scale, he didn't see any reason why the state shouldn't be prepared in similar circumstances to do the same. Is that broadly it? Yeah. And we've, yeah. And we've got one other at the back. Would you like another view? Yes, please. Okay. One more. Yes, well, I, I, there are two problems with that. I mean, first of all, there's a question of what you mean by torture, cruel, inhuman, and grain punishment, etc. But in reality, it's the assumption that it is all right to torture somebody if they're affecting your family. Um, I, I don't accept that, that, that premise, and therefore the, the conclusion follow, doesn't follow at all. Now, if, if one shouldn't torture at all, then the state shouldn't torture at all. But I do come back to the question of what is torture? We've had this problem in a number of cases. I certainly don't agree that long-term imprisonment is torture. 
So, um, uh, a contrary view. Um, first of all, what, what is torture as a matter of law, but also, I think, as a matter of human practice? Um, and secondly, is it ever right for states or individuals to carry out acts of torture? Um, and I think this gentleman's view is it, it never is, depending on what torture is. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. uh, thank you all very much. I think I'm going to move to the next topic soon, but I, I, I hope that in both these very limited examples I've been able to give you and, and you'll find them regularly in the daily papers. I hope that it may emerge as one view of the development of human rights law in Europe, uh, but also around the world, that the process of getting towards the best answer takes time, takes thought, and that we should be prepared to tolerate that process because if we don't and if we make very rapid reactions to these important issues like torture and family life we may land up diminishing ourselves without necessarily advancing the cause of mankind generally but i wanted to turn to another topic more shortly that is um, probably in a different category and likely to inspire more polarized views than the thoughtful views that you have expressed and that's the voting rights of prisoners. Um, the history is not uninteresting because we might think looking back over immediately recent decades that prisoners have never had the right to vote and that would in fact be quite untrue because the, the mechanism by which once the vote had been granted it was taken away is, is quite interesting. You got the vote or men got the vote in the famous reform of 1832 by owning property worth at least 10 pounds. When you went to prison for what was called a felony, you lost your entire, you lost all your property. So you lost your property and you lost thereby your right to vote. Um, misdemeanors, the lesser form of crime, when they were categorized in those two different ways, did not lose their rights to vote. Although, of course, if for the misdemeanor, they had been in uh, custody at the, on polling day, well, it would have been a bit tricky, wouldn't it? Because they wouldn't have been get up, able to get up. Well, that was the 1832 uh, Reform Act. And shortly after the second great Reform Act of 1867, wasn't it? the Forfeiture Act uh, of 1870 denied uh, s offenders their rights of citizenship and introduced specific provisions that convicted persons were incapable of voting during the time that they were detained. And that continued, really, until it was enshrined in the 1967 Criminal Law Act. There are particular difficulties and technicalities about um, remand prisoners, and it's worth observing as a matter of history that prisoners of some kinds were affecting postal votes between 1948 and 1969. But by the time we get to 2003, when this regularly discussed issue was raised again, and I think it's on a slide, Alex. Um, let me just see if I can get to mine. Yes, I can. Um, I've, set, I've set out the history here. The 1832 Act, the Common Law, before 1870, 
Um, and then the Forfeiture Act, which removed the rule by felons um, by which they lost their land, so the felons would have got their vote. But then Section 2 provided that any person convicted of treason or felony and sentenced to imprisonment for 12 months lost the right to vote. And then that was in effect until 1967. Um, there are other problems about, as it were, getting your vote, because under the Representation of People Act of 1918, electors had to be able to prove six month residence at a qualifying address, and a prison was not a qualifying address. So you, you couldn't register to vote. Um, and the same applied to other asylums of one kind or another. But um, we come then to the position as stated in 2003, when Lord Lester of Hearn Hill, a famous uh, human rights lawyer, asked the question of the government. And the Minister of State, the Home Office, Baroness Scotland, said this. It has been the view of successive governments that prisoners convicted of a crime serious enough to warrant imprisonment have lost the moral authority to vote. Well, if, if we had a chance, and perhaps we may, because I can deal with what needs to follow, I think quite briefly, what does, what does one think of the notion of the moral authority to vote. The argument against is that when you're in prison, the only thing you lose is the right to free movement. You don't lose anything else. The state doesn't have the power to take anything else away from you. So in this way, you don't really lose the right to vote unless government says so very specifically. But here, Baroness Scotland is summarizing a long period of um, opposition to prisoner voting in this way. Before we come back to look at that, and I think that is the last slide, so it can stay up there, um, you may be interested to know that at least 18 European nations, including such uh, gentle lands as Denmark, Finland, and Sweden, have no form of electoral ban for imprisoned offenders. Other countries have various restrictions, uh, some by length of sentence, some by category of crime. And the European countries which allow no prisoner votes include what you would perhaps be surprised to see by list, Bulgaria, Estonia, Georgia, Hungary, and Liechtenstein. Other parts of the world demonstrate different behaviors. Russia and Japan exclude all convicted prisoners from voting. In some parts of the United States, prisoners are banned from voting even after they've been released from jail. Well, now, this matter went to the European Court and the European, in a case called Hearst, and the European Court, to take the story quickly, was absolutely against the additional ban that England was proposing and, and, and was standing by. And it's pretty clear that if England had, uh, the United Kingdom had had a um, qualified form of restriction then it would have passed muster. And the plan has been, following various consultation processes, the plan has been to bring in a restriction, maybe of two years or something of that, or 12 months or two years. But it hasn't yet happened. It is a politically tasty potato. But what do you think? Let's go back to the way Baroness Scotland summarized it. Losing the moral authority to vote. Don't use her words, but with Sarah, would you like to explain how you think 
this problem should be approached. Okay, yes, we've got a taker at the back. I've, I've been concerned about this because I think that there should be an arrangement whereby prisoners are prepared to return to society. Now, whether you should have um, a blanket of either 12 months or two years when people can't vote, or whether you should say that within the last one year of a, of a sentence, people should be allowed to vote. It seems to me that by excluding prisoners from the electoral roll, you are in fact um, depriving them um, of any opportunity of being part of the normal society. And surely prison is meant to be not simply a punishment, but also um, a means of preparing people to return to, to the society that we have. Um, so I don't know how much of that you heard, Geoffrey. I heard all of that, oh, and good. it was very okay. clear, and if I may say so, extremely articulate. Sarah, can you find another taker? Yes. I'm sorry you can't uh, run downstairs to the basement. I have a, can I yes. just tell the basement, no, not the basement, the lower ground and floor, <laughs> that um, I'm awfully sorry we don't have the technique for allowing you to take part in the questioning. The microphone aren't, aren't powerful enough to work through the floor. Um, uh, um, but nevertheless, we are really pleased that you're there. Sarah, see if you can find someone yes, else. Yes, we've got somebody else. I would agree with the original notion proposed that um, after 12 months, because I think that if, if a person would be in prison for more than 12 months, it, for example, if they were given a life sentence, yeah. the vast, the thousands, if not if thousands of thousands of prisoners who would have such a massive influence if they were given the right to vote, the massive influence which, which they would have over the running of this country would be would completely sway any kind of election, election and would completely influence our input. And so if they are imprisoned for, for a number of years, for example, they would have a massive influence our, over our lives individually, but because they are within the prison itself, it would have a minimal impact on their lives. Did you hear that, Geoffrey? No, I didn't hear all of that. Okay. So the concern was that if you give the vote to prisoners who are serving long sentences, that that might um, have an undue influence on, uh, I suppose, the outcome of an election um, because of the large body of people that this gentleman felt would be serving those sorts of sentences. But, of course, they are people who, because they are incarcerated, have a very restricted view of the world, and also um, the outcome of an election would have little, if any, impact on them personally. Thank you very much. That's a very interesting view. Anybody else like to contribute One on more this? who we haven't heard from before. The gentleman over there. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes. I've got right. the mic. Yeah, okay. uh, I, I love this notion of moral authority. Who are these people with moral authority? I know lots of people I wouldn't trust to see my sister across the road. <laughs> um, I don't have a sister, as it happens. Um, but, um, sorry, I've, I've lost my own thread now. Um, it, it, it's a slippery slope. Uh, the prison is, deprives people of liberty, and that's been said, and we all agree that's, that's what it does. When you start depriving the people of other things, where does it end? Why not say, well, they can't read newspapers because uh, new, the news isn't important because they're in prison. Maybe we should say they can't have health care. Um, nothing makes me want to be sick more than hearing Mr. Cameron saying nothing makes him want to be sick more than uh, prisoners not having the right to vote. That seems to be a kind of priggishness, and I think that statement lacks moral authority, in fact. Um, I even think it might be a good idea to have an MP whose constituency was the prisons. And uh, all prisoners could vote for a, an MP who would, uh, who would represent them all. Uh, or possibly we would have two MPs representing the prison. Thank you. Thank you, yeah, thank you very much indeed. That's a very interesting contribution as well. And I must now bring this um, somewhat unusual session to a close with a few remarks that I hope you will permit me to make. Um, first, 
the it's quite clear that I better go away the next time I want an interactive debate because you do better with Sarah there than with me there. Um, and I think it's been a very a very excellent contribution and discussion. Um, secondly, one when when one frees oneself from instinctive reactions, these human rights issues, whether human rights exist and so on and so forth, uh, taken for ed, as read, um, uh, are matters that should provoke thought because they are serious and difficult problems. And I repeat that which I said at the beginning, they may not be exactly the sorts of things that are apt for yes, no answers on oh, voting papers if you've got the vote. Next time, I'll try and look, and again, I'd be grateful for contributions coming ahead, at the ways in which so-called human rights um, issues have definitely served the public good or have served the public in a way that is thought to be good. And I will try and give you some references in the handout next week that will cover some of the things we've discussed this week, for I regret to tell you there is no handout for you to take home tonight. Can I express my gratitude to Sarah for stepping into the breach and doing so well at teasing out of you opinions that have been uh, a, a great pleasure to listen to and to have relayed to me, to the staff who've made this possible, and, and to repeat my regret that I'm not with you. But as it was a, uh, for a cause that was, in a sense, a breach of a human right, even mine, on this occasion, my absence from you in person is not something for which I think I need apologize. Thank you very much.